name is Otaviano Canuto, and I'm a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the Near South. We're here today to talk about the perfect storm that coronavirus has brought to developing countries. In a previous video, we approached why and how to flatten coronavirus curves of infection and recession is of utmost relevance. Developing countries have some features that will make it harder for them to flatten their domestic coronavirus curves of infection and recession. Furthermore, coronavirus has brought strong headwinds from the economies where it has ravaged previously this year. And developing countries have been hit by shocks coming from China, Europe, and the United States. Commodity price, so relevant to many developing countries, have declined. Tourism has come to a halt. Remittance, also so important for many poor countries, are declining. And foreign capital flows to emerging markets and frontier markets have flowed out. We'll also give a look at some of the proposals to improve the role of the IMF as an international lender of last resort, so as to make it capable of supporting developing countries in the fight against coronavirus. We'll also argue that some form of debt relief will likely be necessary. So why one can say that it will be harder to flatten corona curves in developing countries? First, remember that flattening the infection curve is fundamental to avoid the overwhelming of the existing clinical hospital capacity of countries and the tall rate of deaths that come with that. Second, the epidemic containment measures to achieve that flattening tend to bring additional dampening to the economic activity with a negative impact, particularly on the poor part of the population. That's why everywhere governments, which are the ultimate insurers against catastrophes like the one at play, have announced policy packages to minimize bankruptcies of solvent but illiquid enterprise, to minimize the unemployment wave, as well as to provide some income support to those poor people who are suddenly losing their sources of revenue. Now, look at this table with data on countries according to the World Bank classification of countries by per capita income. Note how on public health capacity, the number of uh, hospital beds per thousand people goes down dramatically as one moves down the income ladder. Many people do not have access to essential healthcare service and are not covered by health insurance. The capacity to treat COVID-19 patients that is Specialized hospital service with ventilators to cope with critical cases is grossly inadequate in many low and even middle income countries. Just to give an idea, Malawi has 25 public intensive care beds for a population of 17 million, and Zimbabwe has none. There is also the issue of rampant informality in developing countries. In low and middle income countries, 50% to 90% of total employment consists of informal labor, as you can see on the table. And informal labor uh, does not have benefits such as unemployment insurance, health insurance, and paid leave. Labor informality means that relief or recovery policies aimed at formal labor, such as increasing the unemployment insurance, reducing payroll and income taxes, and extending paid sick leave 
have very limited effects. Low and middle income countries also do not have enough fiscal space. That is to say, the ability to deploy uh, public funds in resource to counter a large negative shock. They apparently do not have larger public debt to GDP ratios as compared to developed countries, but their debt is more subject to exchange rate and maturity risks. Also, you can see that their credit ratings is lower and uh, their financial markets are shallower. Furthermore, as we will approach later, the uh, flight to quality in financial markets that has taken place since January has meant that for some countries, it will be more difficult to borrow externally to cover their fiscal deficit. Social distancing policies are also harder to implement where a substantial part of the population of a country lives in slums, as the ones depicted in this chart. Selective isolation would also be hard to implement, given the lack of technology and government capacity to do it, like in Singapore and Germany. Well, and as I have said, it is a perfect storm. Even before the new coronavirus landed in its new front, Latin America, Africa, and much of Asia, the economic impact arrived before the epidemic itself. Tourism has collapsed. Remittance, so important to some developed economies, are dwindling. Many foreign workers in Western cities Think of those working as hotel staff, restaurant chefs, or drivers have lost their jobs. Prices of commodities, so key for government revenues in many natural resource dependent developing countries, have also tumbled as compared to the end of last year, as you can see in the picture. The oil price downfall aggravated by the tug of war between Saudi Arabia and Russia, hit hard on oil exporters in Africa and Latin America. And as you can see in the chart, emerging market assets have been dumped in a scale never seen before, what is reflected in the evolution of the MSCI Emerging Market Index. Well, the global economy has delved into a slump. And the pandemic and economic aspects of the coronavirus dynamics triggered shocks to financial markets in advanced countries. The prospects of deteriorated earnings and heightened uncertainty have led to a broad portfolio switch from risky assets to the safe haven of US short-term treasuries. And the dash for cash, uh, accompanying the flight to safety, hard hit foreign capital flows to emerging markets. markets. The search for safety sparked by uncertainty and fear has led to a strong wave of portfolio capital outflows from emerging markets. Heavy pressures toward depreciation of their currencies accompanied the winding down of both equity and debt positions that you were seeing in this chart. According to the Institute of International Finance, foreign investors took close to $100 billion out of emerging markets as the financial shock in advanced economies unfolded in the first weeks of March. It has been the largest portfolio capital outflow ever recorded. And if you have 
any doubt about the intensity of what has been happening. Compare the outflows with previous episodes, including the global financial crisis of 2008, the taper tent, the global financial crisis, the taper tantrum of 2013, in that episode of scare about China's finance and capital outflows in 2015. Concerns about debt repayment capacity and the dollar liquidity needs of some emerging markets have particularly increased. This chart illustrates the point by highlighting some emerging markets where the sum of short-term foreign debt and current account debts is larger or close to their liquid foreign exchange reserves. Argentina and Turkey, to the left here, stand out as the two countries with external funding needs in the short term, not fully covered by liquid foreign exchange reserves. South Africa and Malaysia are not far behind, although with ratios below 100%. There is also the fragility associated with uh, foreign exchange denominated debt as a share of GDP. The flight for safety has led to a dollar appreciation and made more acute a problem with scarcity of dollars that has recently plagued global finance. Funding costs and costs of hedging foreign currency exposure rose substantial by mid-March. Not by chance, the Federal Reserve Bank extended its web of foreign currency swap lines with other central banks, including emerging markets like Brazil and Mexico, while also reducing interest rates on existing swap lines. The exposure to foreign exchange debt denomination of emerging markets is, is illustrated in this chart. Even in the case where there has been less of a problem with currency mismatch between debt service and revenues, that is to say, those countries where debt is held by a private sector with foreign exchange revenues, the global economic and trade slump brings risks as it is impacting such revenues. In the case of poor developing countries, as the World Bank and the IMF have shown in recent, in, in recent works, uh, they have built up high and unsustainable amounts of foreign debt in the recent past. Servicing that debt at a time of drought in source of refinance uh, has become harder, particularly as commodity prices and tourism have slumped. And all this is happening at the same time as those countries need to face the task of flattening their domestic pandemic and recession curves. Naturally, demand for support from the IMF and the World Bank in the fight against coronavirus is rising to the roof. And these institutions face a ceiling in terms of possibility of support a setting that must be lived. The IMF is being called to play its role as an international lender of last resort. Kristalina Georgieva, the IMF's managing director, said last week that the institution has $1 trillion in loanable funds. But that lending capacity is to be exercised through facilities that vary in the borrowing caps and in the degrees of conditionality attached to them. The IMF will have to show more flexibility. The IMF has received calls for emergency lending associated to coronavirus uh, from 98 countries so far. Access to the IMF's emergency facilities has been doubled allowing it to, in principle, to meet the expected demand 
of about $100 billion in financing. She also mentioned the uh, precautionary credit lines as something that must be reviewed in order to encourage additional liquidity support. There was also reference to a short-term liquidity line that may be established. And also that countries' financing needs may be met via other options, including the use of special drawing rights, the SDRs. SDRs is the accounting money created and allocated within the MF. It is not usable in private markets, but it can be swapped uh, among members. And so increasing the country's SDR allocations, uh, which can be accessed unconditionally, is one way to help meet financing needs with uh, lower borrowing from the IMF. Another option on the table is for the IMF membership to increase the grant element of the borrowing as has been done for concessional lending to low-income countries. That is to say, reduce the interest rate and extend the repayment period considerably beyond what is standard in the traditional IMF facilities. The MF might even add a grace period for repayments to ensure debt sustainability. Now, talking about debt sustainability, the biggest impediment to the IMF using its $1 trillion lending capacity is that it needs to ensure that the borrowing country's debt is sustainable. The IMF cannot lend to a country knowing ex ante that doing so would make its debt unsustainable. And given the state of shock in financial markets and the large increase in fiscal deficits and debt that are likely to rise in developing countries, even if one assumes that global interest rates will remain close to zero for an extended period, it is unlikely that debt can be assessed to be sustainable for many countries where financing needs will be large. For the short term, the IMF and the World Bank have called for a standstill of debt service to official bilateral creditors for the world's poorest countries. But it should go beyond that. To head off the coming wave, of sovereign defaults, a coordinated broad debt moratorium might be pursued. The, uh, for those countries that requested such a freeze, the moratorium would suspend all sovereign debt repayments to private and public creditors, including emerging and developing economies that wanted to do so. That could stay until the coronavirus health crisis Pass. Well, fact is that the coronavirus has brought multiple negative shocks and, uh, and given the magnitude of those shocks, international support will be needed as developing countries see governments' revenues drop and their access to financial markets dry up. We'll need that. Stay tuned.